now that I showed you how to implement Atomic Long, or rather how Atomic Long is implemented by the Java class library writers, let's talk about how you can apply Atomic Long, and what kinds of things you can use it for. And this, this example is kind of a fun example. So what we're going to do here is we're going to show you a little snippet of code from the Java class library. This is the Java random class. And as you might expect, the Java random class is used to generate random numbers. And internally, it uses an atomic long to generate seed values, because you need to seed the random number generator, that will end up generating relatively unique results. We're trying to make the random number generator work as randomly as random number generators can work, if that makes any sense. And you can see all the source code here at the link at the bottom of the slide. OK, so here's what it looks like. You can see that the constructor of random is going to uh, call up to a default constructor, and it's going to pass in the results of seed uniqueifier, which is a funny name. We'll look at what a seed uniqueifier is in a second. And then we're going to XOR that with system.nanotime. And system.nanotime, of course, is a monotonically increasing number, which should never repeat, because time, time marches on, as they say. And so what we're doing here is we're trying to create a, a random seed, or as random as we can get. What you see down here is we have an atomic long, which is a static final, which means that it's initialized once and never, never changed. And it's also something that can be available to all instances of random. And we give it a nice big honking value. See, we make a nice atomic long with this very large value. I won't even bother reading it, but you can see it's long. So that's, that's what seed uniqueifier is set to. And then we have this factory method. And this factory method, as you see, is what's called up here in the constructor of random. It's going to automatically generate the next unique seed value. And let's take a look and see how that works. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a for loop. And you'll, you'll see why we use a for loop in a second. Uh, we want to do this because we want to keep going until we are successful at generating the next number that we think is appropriate. So we use this. This is a classic forever loop. You could also use a while true loop if you want, but this is just the way they do it in the Java class. And then what we do is we go ahead and we atomically read the current seed value. And the thing to remember about this is that multiple threads running on multiple cores within a process could all be calling this get operation concurrently. So they'll all call get concurrently. That'll atomically read into the local processor cache, the local processor core cache, the current value, which, as you can see, starts out um, with the initialization we made down below. And then what we do is we compute a potential next seed value. So we take the current seed value, and we go ahead and we multiply it by some other big number. Notice that this call is deterministic. Whatever we had before, we're going to get the same results each time we call it. And then what we're going to do is we're going to try to set the computed next seed atomically. And this is going to succeed if and only if S, which was the original seed, is still equal to the seed value. And so what's happening there is we're trying to see if we can atomically make this work without having to worry about side effects from other threads that are being called at the same time. And notice how comparing set is only called once per loop per thread and will only succeed in one thread. So all the other threads that call will get, they will fail because their version of S will not be equal to what the version was when they did the original get because we were atomically updating it. That's the whole point of calling seed uniqueifier compare and set S common next. So only one of those, those threads will actually make the change atomically to give it the, the unique value that we use to XOR with nanotime. So if we succeeded, if we were able to atomically set things and we're the, the first thread to do this atomically, then that will be the next seed value that gets returned. And that will then automatically update everything under the hood. And all those other values will just be ignored. And they will keep spinning until they can uniquely get their own values. And that way, 
the different threads that are calling the random number generator at the same time will all get different seed values that are unique. And we just keep keeps doing that until it gets a unique seed value. So the um, if the code is run concurrently on multiple threads and multiple cords, the resulting seeds may in fact be identical. If, if we just used the code like this. Um, so, so the point of this, you know, the point of doing all the stuff we're talking about here is to ensure that there are unique seeds for the different cores. And if we didn't do this trick here with the loop and the compare and set call, you could end up with multiple threads getting identical seeds, which would then make the random number generator less random because they'd all start out with the same seed value or something very close to it. So this call here, as I showed you in red, that is actually not atomic because we're calling get and we're calling set. And those are two operations. Instead, we want to call compare and set, which will atomically make the change. And the reason that I, I really focus in on this is when you do assignment 1B, you have to get accustomed to using the compare and set method, not making a get call followed by a set call, because get followed by set will not be atomic in the overall operation. Each one of those things will be atomic, but there's a window between when get is called and when set is called. And during that window where things aren't synchronized, another thread can sneak in and make a change that will lead to very unexpected results or very unwanted results. So you have to get used to using the atomic operations. And I'm saying this now, inevitably someone will get it wrong and I'll, I'll review this and we'll talk about it in the Frequently Made Mistakes video, but I'm trying to preempt that as much as I can here. Um, even clever implementations in Java 8 would suffer from the same problem. So you need to use the, the compare and swap uh, operation. Okay, so that's the end of the discussion about how to apply Java Atomic Long or how Java Atomic Long can be applied in practice and where you need to use these mechanisms for compare and set.